sorry. Uh, I'm expecting and uh, still on the, you know, under mid-bifford care and uh, still on the fence about home versus hospital birth. I mean, mostly because I can't sort out the perceived versus the actual risks. And so what we want to know about is the absolute worst outcomes. <laughs> and uh, what we're interested in is, um, you know, I'm not afraid to start labor at home. I'm not afraid to transfer to a hospital. I'm not afraid to transfer to a hospital in an ambulance if I have to, so long as we both make it. And so I want to know about what are those situations when you don't get to the hospital on time and what really happens? Because the images that float in my head are maternal death, prolonged and severe disability to the baby, worse, you know, all of those. What are the real risks? And of those risks, which ones are the ones that wouldn't have happened if I would started in the hospital? When I'm an obstetrician and I'd say have a home birth, um, if you're low risk and you're eligible, those risks are so small that even when you have an obstetrician's perception of risk, and, and I like to think I have a balanced obstetrician's perception of risk, that they really are so remote that um, it, the chance of them happening is, we, we just don't know for sure, but the chance is probably similar between hospital and home birth. And, and also, we just really need to remember that, you know, when we're looking at, say, babies with severe injuries like cerebral palsy, the vast majority of those occur outside of labor. They've already occurred when you go into labor, and they have nothing to do with labor at all. And so, you know, that risk is going to be the same between home birth and hospital birth. And when you, when you look at large retrospective population like they've done in the United States, you might find that there's incidences of cerebral palsy in a home birth. But that's okay because there's always going to be incidences in a hospital and, and we, we haven't been able to change that risk. No matter anything that we've done intervention-wise in medicine, the risk of cerebral palsy now as it was to the 50s is absolutely unchanged. So, um, you know, things like maternal death are vanishingly rare. There are 40,000 births in British Columbia and six women die every year. I mean, that risk is so small that it's, it, to be focusing on that as a potential risk is really, um, you're, you're really focusing on something that's, it, you know, you may as well buy lottery tickets on a regular basis and, and be planning on building your retirement on the lottery. Just a, a, hello? a simple statistic that I have used to explain the, the chance of having a stillbirth, which is your baby dying for an unknown reason, is about one in a thousand, and that hasn't changed for a long time. The chance of your partner, who's sitting next to you, who I guess is in his mid to late 30s, of having a heart attack is about the same. Now, are we walk, are 35-year-old men walking around worrying about having a heart attack this year? So that kind of degree of risk, one in a thousand, is something most people don't worry about. I also want to comment that um, of the women that died during childbirth, a large proportion of these are women who themselves were born with heart defects and long-term chronic health problems that they've known about before they got pregnant. And then there's other very bizarre, unusual things that can happen, like air embolisms, that we don't understand and are not related to place of birth whatsoever. So I just wouldn't even spend time on that if you're a healthy woman to start with. And really in terms of um, problems with babies, I just think that a good way of dealing with that if you're worried or anxious is to be close to hospital. And here in Surrey, you are. Now, if you're 60 miles on a rural road in northern British Columbia, you might deal with that the way some women do which is they, re they actually have a hotel room close to the hospital. And you might be interested to know that the Century Plaza Hotel, right beside St. Paul's Hospital, has three rooms reserved for home births, even though they're actually in the hotel. Because your anxiety means something, too. You have to take care of that. And whatever your reasons are, that's just one more choice. You can be in a friend's house or in a motel or somewhere that's real close to hospital. So that's just something that you can do if you like. Um, so I, I want to I address two things that you said. One is um, the, 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 key, the key question, I think, is 
would the outcome have been different if you were in a supported setting? And I think you have forgotten one important question, and that is, what about what happens in the hospital? Because there is this uh, underlying assumption in our entire society that birth, death doesn't happen in the hospital, stillbirth doesn't happen in the hospital, loss doesn't happen in the hospital, complications don't happen in the hospital, but you know, if we have one to two percent of the population who's having births out, you know, outside the hospital, you know that most of those bad outcomes are happening in the hospital. So things happen in all settings. It is not about the, the, what, what Patty's research has seen and the research from the Netherlands, which looked at 500,000 cases, 329,000 cases, uh, which were home birth, planned home birth, is that when you look at large populations, the risks, I even when you compare you know, apples to apples, low-risk women to low-risk women, the same midwives here in British Columbia with the same midwives, the risks are about equal for those catastrophic events across base settings. And what that means is if it's you, you're going to ask those questions. But you know what? You should ask those questions in your in the hospital. People don't often, if something happens in the hospital, they say, oh, too bad, we're so sorry for you. And if something happens in the hospital, people say, well, you should have been in, ho in or if something happens at home, oh, you should have been in hospital. Whereas in fact, many of the outcomes, even the outcomes that in the worst studies in the United States, where they talked about neonatal mortality, if you really parse it down, those were babies with congenital heart anomalies, you know, a lot of them, <laughs> who would not have survived wherever they were. So life is not certain. Your risk of having uh, uh, some injury to yourself, your baby, is far greater when you walk out of this restaurant and get in your car and put your seatbelt on. Probably, I don't know the actual statistics, but I'm going to find out. I think it's probably 50 to 100 times more your risk every single time you get in the car. But that's an acceptable risk. We don't even think about that, right? Why is it that home birth has become such a hot button topic that we can't even think rationally about what's acceptable risk? I do know that when you look at the numbers in the studies that were here in BC, the numbers were big enough that there were, if there was going to be a difference between the really bad baby injury, which is hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, which is basically no oxygen to your brain, the numbers were big enough that if you look at the incidence of that in women having vaginal birth, uh, we should have seen a difference. And certainly in the Dutch study, the numbers an, of that should, are big enough that we definitely would have seen a difference. And I think the main thing around that is, first of all, the worst case of a hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy that I've ever seen in hospital. It was, someone, it was a catastrophic event that none of us actually even really realized that was going on. And we thought we were in the midst of a very normal birth and we had a very ill baby. Um, and I think that that would have been the same whether you were in the home or in the hospital. And, and I think the, the other thing is that um, the midwives have all of the equipment to do the type of resuscitation that we do in a hospital at home down to very high risk I interventions where they would be putting intravenous lines into a baby's umbilical cord. They have all that equipment with them and they take it all. And in fact, because they're doing home births, they are required to do their what's called neonatal resuscitation program every year, whereas the national standard for that is every two years. So if anything, they're more prepared to resuscitate a baby than I am when I'm there with myself and a nurse doing a delivery. And I'm an obstetrician and unlike the family doctors, I'm not really comfortable with very little babies. I sort of like to give them away to somebody else. And so the nurse and I are in there, and, and if something goes awry, we're waiting for a, an expert to come and help us, whereas the midwife's got two well-trained people that keep up on their skills there at a home birth. I'm not trying to scare you if you're planning a hospital birth because we do have people very close, but maybe not quite as close as at a home birth. So I think that that's a really important thing for women to know is that in terms of medical safety, what, we, what provision do we have for care for the baby and the mom? Many of the same 
uh, equipment, the same medications, the same things that we're relying on in hospital that work really well. The midwives have with them in the home setting and they work just as well at home. And there's all these other things that Sarah has alluded to that, you know, some evidence around uh, midwif midwives doing what they call the sacred preservation of the third stage in labor, is that is that how you'd call it? It's sort of just really guarding the woman's physiology and keeping it normal. There's actually starting to be very good research that shows that that approach to the third stage of labor is just as effective as the very active medically interventionist style that we take as physicians. And so I think those things are really not always looked at, but are really important. And as we start to look at them, we start to see how important they are. And so we, that's the part that Saris is alluding to, that there's this whole understanding of birth that occurs outside of a hospital that doctors don't really know about and haven't really looked at. And it's those things that create safety. So we need to attend to them.